Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Uh, in this video, I am continuing my analysis into Frederick Nietzsche's Will to Power. Um, as you guys who have been following along know, I'm using the Walter Kaufman translation of the text. And um, this particular section, section 13.1, it's a different type of section. It's, it's a very... The, the, the lecture is connected to it, a very emotional feeling for me. Um, and it's on the role of sophistry and the role of the sophist for Nietzsche. And we, we primarily think of the sophist, or someone in contemporary sort of English discourse uses the word sophistry, it's used pejoratively, negatively, right? To be a sophist is a bad thing. Um, there's a historical reason for the association that we have within the linguistic community and the idea, the concept, sophist and sophistry. And this is, for me, one of those lectures where, where there is no sort of ghetto philosophy, right? Where we begin at the bottom. Um, and, this, you know, I'm, again, for me... It's this type of discussion that I think we, we academics need to be having. This isn't a, though my lecture series and though my YouTube videos are obviously public, you know, this is not meant for the general public at all. I do welcome the general public to, to engage in the discussion. Um, and I hope that all the references that are made are understandable and easily digestible. But this is one of those lectures where there is a, there's a certain tone of seriousness that needs to be established at the beginning because Nietzsche is dead serious and I am even more serious than Nietzsche is with respect to sort of cultivating sophistry within the philosophical community, cultivating the sophist as an individual. Um, and cultivating the idea of sophistry as a concept that hopefully will transform the way in which we think about what it is to be a sophist. So again, a little disclaimer as to sort of the theoretical framework of this discussion. For me, this is, you know, this is not necessarily intended for a general audience, and I'm, I'm going to just go completely crazy <laughs> on this lecture. Um, the notes, you know how to get them. Click the link in the description. It's 13.1 and it only covers 27, 28, 29, and 30. So four, four notes. This is Nietzsche's Will to Power. And this is section 13.1. And it covers notes 427 through 430. And I've titled this section On the Power of Hellenic Sophistry. On the Power of Hellenic On the Power of Hellenic Sophistry. This is again a very, for me, a very, and I would argue for Nietzsche a very, very, absolutely critical section. To begin, um, the sophist is the traditional form. Right? Nietzsche looks at the idea of the sophist and the idea of sophistry as the traditional. This is his word. Right? The traditional form. right, And that is the form of philosophy. So that when we talk about philosophy in the Cheyan terms, there is what you might consider to be the pop philosophy, sort of the faddish philosophy, which is post-Hellenic sophistry, and then the real deal traditional philosophy, which is Hellenic philosophy and prior. Right? Um, I've done, and previous, I've done a lecture series on 
the, the ancients. Um, I've talked about Anaxagoras and Anaximenes, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, Democritus, Thucydides. This is what he's talking about, right? The pre-Socratics, right? Those thinkers that formulated concepts of cosmology and cosmogony in terms of their situatedness within this world, within existence, right? Their relationship, their discussion, their assessment of being, but not being as transcendental, right? Being as developing from a previous concept of air, from a previous concept of water, right? F from a prior concept of fire, in the case of, um, in the case of Heraclitus, right? The idea is we have a sense, or even in its most abstract, Pythagoras, where we recognize in sort of the role of numbers more in a numerological sense than a mathematical sense, but still sort of the functioning of numbers. The idea is the relationship between the philosopher as thinker and the world was not facilitated by any intermediary. Right? There was no liaison. It was direct connection, visceral, gut, pagan, if you will, connection to an understanding both cosmological, epistemological, based on my connection and my sensibility with my fellow human beings and with the world, with nature as such. This is divorced later, but I don't want to jump ahead too far because we need more concepts before we get to that. So the traditional form refers to um, basically the pre-Socratic and those things prior, right? Homer, Hesiod, uh, that is the reference uh, with which Nietzsche is talking. Again, as I said, this, this, this lecture is, this lecture will be a lot deeper than most. The polis, quote from Nietzsche, this is note um, 427, the polis loses its faith in the uniqueness of its culture. In this right to rule over every other polis, one exchanges cultures, that is, the gods. Now, I do have to stop there and explain that, right? The polis, P-O, right? The polis was the system in place of free Athenian-born male property owners um, were given the ability to have voice in their community, right? Um, medics weren't able to have voice, women weren't able to have voice, slaves weren't able to have voice for the most part, and the polis ran the show, the political establishment, right, as such. What ends up happening is we recognize that the polis of one population um, in relationship to the polis of other populations, there's going to be a cultural exchange, right? So that the cultural exchanges between populations occurs as populations migrate, right? This is obviously a consequence of, of any social dispersion of any demography, right? As we move, we take our foods with us. This is why we have a little Jamaica, or a little Haiti, or a little Cuba, or a little Havana, or what have you. Right? But not only do we bring our foods and our culture and our language and our mannerisms, we also, we also bring, as part of this exchange between the polis, our beliefs. Our beliefs, our beliefs in the gods, our beliefs in the spirits, right? So the polis loses faith in the uniqueness of its culture. The idea that I have, that my culture is so unique that it stands above and beyond any other culture, is devalued in this cultural exchange, in the right to rule over other polis. One exchanges colors, cultures, that is, gods, so the beliefs are exchanged. One thereby loses faith in the sole prerogative of the deus, um, deus autocathonos, auto autocathonos, right? Deus autocathonos, and the, I have a reference there, which means you lose faith in the gods of your native soil. As we travel, as we see more of the world, you go to China, you go 